Well, that's a great encouragement, a great reminder, day by day. Thank you, musicians. Hey, uh, we're glad you're here. I mean, I know that we're all getting tired of this cold, miserable weather, but complaining hasn't changed it one bit, and that's kind of a disappointment. And we recognize that it takes extra work to get here on a day like today, and we're really honored by that. And we are determined to make sure that this is an hour that encourages you as well as will instruct you in the matters of the Word of God. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for making the extra effort to do that. Let's ask the Lord's blessing for the service for you, and then we'll begin. Father, we are so blessed. We know that. We're able to get out and to and to encourage and enjoy one another. So, Father, I thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we know that there are many on our list who just cannot get out in this kind of weather. It's just not wise. And, Lord, we're asking that you'd make this a great day of worship for them as well. And, Lord, with that in mind, we're, we're assuming that there are several who are with us by way of the internet connection. And, Father, we're asking that this would be a great day for them as well as we sing together, as we worship together, as we pray together, and then as we learn together. Father, again, we're blessed to be here. We're blessed to, to have all that this country affords, but even more so, we are blessed to think of a day when we will have a new heaven and a new earth and we'll have the very best that you've ever imagined and that we'll experience it for all eternity. Father, that is beyond our ability to understand or even appreciate yet. Father, we, we know that there are several in our congregation who are sick. Lord, I think of Carla Ellis in particular, how she is now dealing with uh, pneumonia. So, uh, Lord, we're asking that you would be with her in particular. And, uh, and for uh, Donna Oberg, Lord, I got a word that she too is sick. So, Father, we're asking that you would strengthen her and encourage her body to heal quickly. Lord, there are many more that we'll discuss later, and we thank you for the opportunity as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Glad to see you here this morning. If you'd stand with us, the great I am. And um, in this song, it talks about being close to God, being near to his heart. And um, with that, um, it says that, that um, heaven is real and death is a lie. That because what Christ did for us, we know that we can now have an opportunity. We can now live with Christ forever in heaven. Um, and that we don't have to um, submit, we don't have to fall into, we do, but we, we know that the power is there um, to not to fall into those traps, not to fall into those things, that he, his power is stronger than all of those. And we, we thank him and we praise him for that. The great I am.
none greater than you. Lord, we um, thank you for um, this love and this grace and mercy that's new to us every day. And um, Lord, I just pray for um, uh, this, the, this people here, this family here this morning, that, that you would um, open our hearts, that you would um, touch us in a way that um, only you can. Lord, we know that you are a faithful God. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Greedy neighbors, you're being seated. Just pulled a Bruce. Told Dad to wait on me, and he's waiting on me, and I'm not up here. Um, if you had an insert in your bulletin, so I'm going to do an announcement real quick um, before Dad comes up. Um, this walking as Jesus walked, and we're going to do a 10-week uh, um, study. It's got a workbook that goes with it. Um, you can read there um, kind of a, an overview of it. The, well, let's watch the video first, and then I'll let you, let you know a little bit more about it. So I ran across Dan Spader as I, I listen to podcasts. I don't drive as much as I used to, but when I would drive, I listen to podcasts everywhere I go. And um, I ran across him, and I ran, I ran across this, and it's, it's um, a, the format is a weekly uh, discussion, and then there's a workbook that goes with it with five short, probably 15-minute, 15, 15, 20-minute um, daily uh, lessons in it um, to, keep in, to keep within it through the week. And so... Um, there's a sample. I've got a, a binder back here on the back table. I had two copies of it. Michael's got one, and he's gone this week, and I don't know where the other one went. Um, I've got to figure out where that's at. But there's a, a sample back there of the first week um, to take a look at it. The first service, this will be at 9.15. Um, this, the first service... Is, is still going to be um, up here, is also going to meet up here. Bruce is working on something a little different with the music, um, involve the kids a little bit, and um, kids will still be up here for the first part. Um, I'm not sure if he was in his right mind at that night or not, but uh, Dad did volunteer. Well, he volunteered himself and Mom. She didn't know anything about it till this morning. Um, but all the kids, they're going to kind of watch all the kids um, for that first part, so that'll be taken care of. Um, but it, Again, it's a 10-week in the basement. If you aren't able to be at all of them, the, the good thing is, is that the book is geared towards um, a, a personal um, study as well, and all the resources are online. And so if you, put your, if you would like to do it, but you're not sure you can be at all of them, please sign up anyway. Give me your email, and I'll make sure to communicate that with you um, and, and give you the resources for that. So um, I think that's, that's the... the all of the, the details there. Um, but what we're looking to, to, to figure out in this, to, to look at, is when we study the life of Christ, when we study what Jesus did and how he did it, um, it's how does, how does that transfer over into our personal life? What does that look like for us personally? What does that look like for us as a church? What does that look like for in our community when we go out into our community? And um, what does that look like in our, in our missions and in the way that we um, are, are supporting there? So um, I, I think it'll be a great um, time. It'll be a great discussion. Um, so think about it. Pray about it. If you'd like to do it, just let me know. We'll make sure you get a book. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. I told Daniel to point at me when it was my turn because I have a habit of coming up here either too soon or too late. But anyway, the uh, adult class that meets downstairs, they will be joining this. So um, I think it's a great, it'll be a great opportunity. And um, it looks like I'm going to have some duties. And grandpas love to pass out candy, so... Your children are going to be very well taken care of, all right? So don't let that in any way deter you from coming to this 10-week this study. It'll be healthy candy, <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> but um, let's go on into our other parts of our bulletin here. There, there's a note here that an Easter choir is, is getting ready to um, start up there in, in April 1st. And if you're interested... Uh, sign up and let Mrs. Mrs. Linda Wade know about that. We still have a sign-up sheet for nursery workers, Sunday school, and junior church for 2018. And if you're looking for a ministry, um, get, prayerfully consider some of that. And if you think you can be used there, make sure you sign up. Um, if not, you're probably going to get asked maybe sometime or another, but... 
try to try to uh, pray about that and, and and see if you can minister in that way. The Grand Prix has been moved back one week to February the seventh, and occasionally our events down at the FBT Club get moved around because of winter weather. So we'll keep you posted on any other changes there. On the back side of the bulletin, quite a few people on the prayer list. A couple to add would be, one would be Tricia Bennett, who is having her appendix removed or already had them removed. To, and she's in the process right now. Okay. So um, her husband, Jeff, right? T Tyler. Okay. Uh, works for Diggs. Okay. So... If you, there are that couple sets over here usually that has that young child. And then Carla Ellis, um, she has double pneumonia and she is in Rochester Hospital. I think that's what you told me, right, Bruce? But you have a room number or anything or just, okay. But keep her on your prayers. And then, uh, you know, you don't see Aubie Bryan on there, at least I don't see him, but keep him in your prayers as well as he's still uh, trying to recover and, and make it. Um, you know, winter is difficult uh, for somebody that's been sick, especially at that age. So keep them in your prayers as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made from the floor? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? If not, ushers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this day, this day that we could come together to worship a mighty and a holy God. And Lord, we thank you for the warm building that you provide us to do that in. And, and Lord, many on our prayer list, a lot of them suffering with different illnesses this winter and and going through surgeries and other complications, Lord. And we just ask that you would help us to, to take that list on the back of our bulletins and to pray for those people and to bring them before you. And, Lord, we just thank you for this church, for our ministry and our community. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep guiding us, helping us, Lord, to have a vision of serving you and to tell others about Christ. And, Lord, now as we give back a portion to what you've given to us, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. And, Lord, you bless us to be in a country where um, we have a great abundance. And so, Lord, help us as, to give with cheerful hearts to give back to you and to spread your word throughout our, our community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
you are able to remain standing with us for our last song this morning. Jesus paid it all. And on the fourth verse, this is just, this is one of my favorite verses of any hymn. It says, when I stand before the throne, or, or, and when before the throne I stand in him complete. When you think about what complete really means, we are complete because sin has separated us from God. It has destroyed our hope of being with Him. Except Christ died, He paid it all so that we can stand there, just as we sang, white as snow. We can stand there blameless before Him. And all of these things that we deal with, all of the, uh, all of the health concerns we deal with, all of the struggles, the temptations, the, everything that we deal with are no longer there. We stand in him complete. We'll sing all four verses of Jesus paid it all. Seated, the kids are dismissed for junior church. Well, thank you, Daniel and Don and Karen. Thank you for your ministry to us. Well, if you're here today, that means you've either been able to escape the viruses going around or you've recovered. So we're really glad that you're here. And we're continuing our study of the life of Christ. Because everything we do is connected chronologically. I mean, that's how we're taught from the very first grade on to read stories, to watch TV shows. In fact, oh, it's been probably 10 or more years ago, there was a movie that was popular. And I sat down to watch it with some of my kids. And it's one of these where they're in a computer and they're flashing back from one place to the other and I might have dozed off for just a minute and wound, my, wound up in a different universe. 
You know, I could never follow the story. I've never tried to watch it since. I thought, give me a story where I know what happens first, second, third, fourth. I mean, we're made that way, in part because we love a story, in part because we've been taught that way. And when the Gospels were written, they were written with uh, the, the emphasis of making a point with particular groups of people. So what we're seeking to do is to put a harmony, you heard that word earlier, a harmony of the Gospels together so that we might understand how it happened from one day to the next. So today we're, we're still in the area uh, near Galilee. In fact, we're entering into that area that you saw a picture of on the video clip. Jesus has been in Jerusalem, his first time in Jerusalem as an adult man, as the teacher. And incredible things are, are already happening in his ministry. Miracles are taking place. Now he's going to go back to his home town area. And that's where the very first miracle that he did publicly, the water into wine. And when we say it was a public ministry, it may not have been, although I'm sure the word spread everywhere, but if you remember, he did not stand in front of the group of people to do this. He simply told some servants, go over there and, and pour the water into those pots and then take that uh, cup up to the you know, master of ceremonies. And I'm sure the word spread everywhere, but even that was not a public ministry. And here we find an unusual ministry because now he's going to deal with a nobleman's son. Let's begin by reading, Jesus restores a Galilean boy. A little bit of uh, review. Last week we talked about Jesus redeems a Samaritan woman. A big deal. Jesus spoke to this Samaritan woman. She was not a good Jewish woman. She wasn't even a good Samaritan woman. There were a lot of things in her past that were just a little bit shady and, and the disciples could not believe that Jesus was talking to her. She couldn't believe it. Why would you, a Jew, be speaking to me? And Jesus gives her the offer that he gives to all of us. You can have living water. And this woman is astounded by what she hears. She goes into her village and says, you need to come and see this man, a man that knows everything about me. And the, and the city pours out. And this is what we read. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves, and now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's emphasize again by way of reminder the power of your story. If you can tell your story, and it sounds a little bit like this. There came a time when the Spirit of God convicted me and, and perhaps he used different people in your life. But nonetheless, the end result was you were brought to a place where you thought, oh no, I am a sinner. And sinners are condemned to die eternally in that awful place called hell. And in my desperation, I cried out and I said, oh God, what is the answer? And someone brought to me the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, the Son of God, born on Christmas Day, living a perfect life, doing miraculous things, teaching incredible truths, that this Jesus went to the cross and there he died for me, a sinner. And when I repented of my sin and I trusted in the payment on Calvary, when I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then something changed. A transaction took place not only in the courts of heaven, but also in my own heart. That I was forgiven. That I was redeemed. That I was made brand new. I became a child of God. Now if that's your story, like the Samaritan woman, there are people who will listen to your story. She went back to the village and she told her story. She did not know a lot of theology. 
She didn't understand all the, the ampl uh, ramifications of this truth that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is God's son. She told her story and the people responded. We have many ministries in our church and they're, they're ministries that are established on biblical principles and our goals are to share the gospel. And it's good that we have those things organized. But the most important ministry this church has is when you go into this next week and when I go into this next week and I am given an opportunity to share my story. Wouldn't you love to know what happened to this Samaritan woman? I mean, that would be a great novel if we could know a little more. This much we know. What is true for her is also true for you as a child of God. In Philippians 1.6, it says this, Paul writes, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You watch the news events like I do. You hear of the rumblings that are happening all around the world. And there's something that stirs within you that makes you think this way. Man, Jesus could come today. I mean, he really could. There's nothing in the way on the calendar. I mean, he could come today. And then finally, the work that he started for some of us decades ago, perhaps for some of you only weeks ago, that work that he started, he is going to complete. And we are going to be in his presence without any shame, without any guilt, no embarrassment, we're going to be, as Daniel was saying earlier, complete in Christ. That's a great story. I imagine, as I'm sure you do, that there are so many people in heaven that we're going to enjoy listening to. I mean, there are people now, every time I'm with a group of people, I try to engage them in conversation and try to learn something about their story. Can you imagine being able to stop and have coffee or tea? Oh, wait a minute. Will they have coffee in heaven? Iced tea, I'm pretty confident they'll have. I don't know about hot coffee, but anyway, however it works in glory, can you imagine being able to sit down and say, you know what, we're going to have a Bible study today, and it's going to be led by the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. She's going to share her testimony of how her life changed. What a great story that will be. But now we go to another part of our story, and we need a bit of an introduction to get ready for it. These dates can be uh, moved back and forth a little bit. We know that Jesus' public ministry was about three and a half years. So perhaps in A.D. 25, John announces that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And just a few weeks or a month or so later, in A.D. 26, Jesus explains his mission to Nicodemus. He says, I have come to be that one lifted up in the wilderness, lifted up on a tree, just like the brazen snake. And then he went into the dreaded territory of Samaria, and there he spoke to that woman we mentioned of in AD 26. And now, after a couple of days of being there, he's moving into Galilee. Now, Galilee is an interesting place. It's an important area of the country, it's up in the northern part of this land we speak of as Judea, as Israel. They have the sea. Of course, the sea is near every area in that area, the Mediterranean Sea. You heard us, and we saw pictures of it, the Sea of Galilee. It's also a place where there are a lot of Gentiles. And that's really interesting in our story today because this is probably a Gentile, may not have been, but it could well have been because he's a nobleman, he's a, a member of the court, and it was primarily a Gentile court. 
So that's where we pick up the story. But a couple of words of introduction here as we read. In Matthew chapter 4, 12 and on, it speaks of this period. And it says, when Jesus heard that John was arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. And he went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum, beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah in the, in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, uh, not Fat, uh, Fatli, Fatali, sorry, beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in the darkness saw a great light. And those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light was shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You know, we live in a great time because we have conquered physical darkness. I mean, it's, it's great, isn't it? I mean, if you have a phone, you've got one of the best flashlights that people would have had a century ago. I mean, they're still walking around with lanterns and, and candles not so many years ago. And now we have a, a flashlight on our phone that can shine and light up a room even. I mean, we have really done a, a, a miraculous thing. We have conquered physical darkness. Rarely do any of us have to be afraid of the dark. But perhaps you can remember a time when you were. Maybe when the lights went out in the home and you couldn't find your flashlight. Because it happens so rarely. Perhaps you were out on the road and your car died and it, it was completely black. All of a sudden, every little noise is amplified. Have you noticed how much better your hearing is when you're in the dark? I mean, you hear things you don't normally hear. I mean, many of us can remember when a time when we were afraid of the dark. But we've conquered that. But nobody on this earth has conquered spiritual darkness. There's only one, and he came from heaven. And Jesus says here, the writer is speaking of him and said that he is the one who came to conquer spiritual darkness because he is the light. It might be good for us to go through a, a week of complete darkness at night to be reminded of the fear that it brings to us the apprehension that we have, because for many of us, we were saved many, many years ago. And we don't remember what spiritual darkness is like, but there are people wandering through our lives right now, and they are absolutely terrified every day because they are living in spiritual darkness. They need to know your story. They need to know the gospel of Christ. So Matthew, while he's talking about this period of time, says, listen, Jesus the light went into this community and he started to preach. And the message of the gospel has always been the same in that it involves repenting of your sin realizing that you're going in the wrong direction and turning to God. Now we understand as the gospel has been presented after the finished work of Christ that that means that I repent of my sin and I say, God, what do I do? How do I get, how do I get right? How do I become right with you? And the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom. God has prepared a way for you to be right with him. In Mark, he writes about this introduction period like this. 
Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Here again, we see where Jesus is spoken of not only as a great teacher, as a great leader, but indeed he is the promised time. He is the one who was promised many years ago. In fact, all the way back into the Garden of Eden, when the first prophecy was given, there is one who is coming and he will crush Satan. We understand now that that very first prophecy is speaking of Christ. That at just the right time, at the promised time, Jesus came. And now we begin to see his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, we see this. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. In this same way, we too are promised this, this filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll not be in our ministry as Jesus was, obviously. But even there, why Jesus came in part was so that he could give to us his Holy Spirit. So that we could watch the way Jesus lived and know that we too can walk in a similar way. Because the same Spirit of God is in us to empower us, to convict us of sin, to convince us of God's will. And that we are to walk like Jesus walked. And now we're back in the book of John where we'll be for the rest of our time. John chapter 4, verse 43, this is the introduction that the old preacher gives. At the end of two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown, and we'll see that uh, dealt with at a later time in our story. Yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. So even now, as Jesus enters into this area, the people know about him. The stories are everywhere. And as typical of human beings, the truth is told and then it's built up and it's twisted and it's elevated and it's enlarged. And, and now people are having these incredible expectations. What will Jesus say? What will he do? What is he really like? Why is he here? So we begin with the story. We look at the place where Jesus restores a Galilean boy. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Canaan where he had turned the water into wine, there was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. That's about 20 miles away. That's important because you see what happens next. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. I know that every mother here, you've experienced that, that fear where a young one, a baby, your child, doesn't matter the age, they're still your baby, right? And they get sick and the temperature spikes and the fever rages on and the coughing and the vomiting. And I mean, we know that fear of, uh-oh, what can we do? This is my baby that is sick. He's got to have help, and, and we're blessed because we can hop in a car and in 15 or 20 minutes be someplace where somebody most probably can give help. In this day, it was very common for every family to lose somebody to sickness. I mean, it would just come in. They had no understanding where it came from. They had no understanding of how to fight against it even how to do the practical things that we seem to know instinctively, 
to lower the temperature and all of that. They did not have under that stand, uh, understanding. This was an ignorant day when it came to medicine. And here's a man, and he is absolutely terrified. He has this sick feeling. He just knows unless something is done right away, his son is going to die. And he's heard about Jesus. Uh, how he heard, I don't know. Whether or not he heard the whole truth or, or this rumored story that's going around. But he is so desperate that he says, I've got to go find this man and I'm going to ask him to intervene to save my son. The plea. This is crisis faith. And then you see the problem. Jesus asks, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? Jesus is wanting to make sure that people are not expecting him to be the star of a carnival. I mean, it's not his job to, to come in and entertain the people by turning things in, you know, water into wine or doing miraculous medical miracles. He was just in Samaria. There, all he did was teach the gospel. That there's living water available and an entire city, a Samaritan city, responded in faith. And now here he is with his people, the Jewish people. And the Gentiles are watching. They're interested. And Jesus says, now listen, I'm not here to do miracles. I'm here to do something more, something better, to teach the gospel, to give you the gospel of the kingdom. Now, Jesus often said things that seemed to be harsh, but his heart was moved by compassion. We see that later on, but he makes that point. So he says, that's the problem. You guys just want to see a miracle all the time. But the persistence of the, office, the official is recorded. Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Jesus is never hard-hearted when it comes to sickness he, he made a point of saying, you let the children come to me, and if anybody interferes with the well-being of a child, they're going to answer to me for it. But here it is, the official says, you've got to come. You don't understand. I just know he's going to die. You've got to come now. And notice the promise that Jesus gives this official, this secular official, perhaps even a secular Jew, uh, Gentile official. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. That's all he said. Go back home, your son will live. Can you imagine how disappointed the people were? Wait a minute. You've got to say more than that. You've got to do more than that. What do you mean? Just telling this heartbroken father, you just go back home, everything will be okay. I mean, that's what they tell you when they don't want you around anymore. Oh, it'll be fine. Just go over there and sit. Just wait over there. But there was something about the way Jesus heard it. That this man responded in belief. Notice it says, the man believed what Jesus said and started home. Here we have crisis faith. Oh, Lord, you've got to do something. And now it's moved to confident faith. Lord, if you say it, I believe it. And now we see the great payoff, the promise and now the payoff. How does this promise uh, change the story? Verse 51. While the man was on his way home, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. I think it's important to understand what the land was like back then. This man at one o'clock, here's the promise, your son is all right. He is going to live. Now it's one in the afternoon. What do you do at one in the afternoon? He could not travel at night. By six o'clock it's going to be dark. He only got part way home and then he had to stop because nobody would travel those roads at night. Too dangerous. Wild animals and wild people there to rob and steal. 
So it was the next day as he's going back home, walking those 20 miles in the, in the dirt and the dust. And can you imagine the battle that was going on in his heart and mind? Is he really alive? Was I just fooled by this man named Jesus? Or did Jesus really do a, mir a miracle for me 20 miles away? And it wasn't long until he saw his servants, recognized them. And can you imagine how, how incredibly joyful it must have been when the man heard the confirmation that at the hour, the minute that Jesus spoke, his son was healed. Can you imagine this dad dancing in that street, so excited that Jesus the Savior responded to his request? It went from crisis faith to confident faith, and now it is confirmed faith. Now I know. I've heard the rest of the story. And let's go on and look here at the latter part, which is a great conclusion. Not only the physical restoration of the boy, but the spiritual redemption of the household. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus this was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. He had crisis faith. Lord, you've got to do something. He had confident faith when he heard the word, the promise of the Lord Jesus. He had confirmed faith when the, the servants came and gave him the good news. And then he had contagious faith. He went home and he said to his family, all of the servants in attendance, I'm sure, because that's how things were done in that day. And as the head of his family, as the head of his household, as the one responsible in his courtyard, he said, listen, listen, I'm telling you right now, trust me, I was there, I experienced it. There is nobody that I've ever met that is like Jesus. Jesus is from God. Now, this man might not have understood the, the importance of prophecy. He might not have understood all of the promises that Jesus would make later on. But he says, I don't know anything, but I know this. This man changed my life and he healed my son. And I'm telling all of you in my household, from now on, this is what we will do. We will believe in him and we will serve him. Men, there's a challenge there for us, is there not? That as fathers, as husbands, as leaders in a community, that we need to say with uncertain terms, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. That's what my testimony is, Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord because this man, Jesus, has changed my life. This man, Jesus, has done miraculous things for me. This is the, the, the tide that's beginning to come into the land of Israel. That there's a great spiritual tide that's beginning to flood the entire area. The person, the personality, the prophecies in, involved with him. The, the telling of the stories, the accomplishment of the miracles. This man is going to change all of Israel. And indeed, when he's hung on the cross, he will change all of eternity. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? And let me ask, and we do it this way because I don't want you to think I'm staring at you. I have no special knowledge. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening in your life. I'm not sure what's been said in your heart. But there has come a great moment of redemption for this man and indeed for his family. Because Jesus changed everything. Have you invited Jesus to change everything in your heart? Has there been a time when you've come and said, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. God, you know it better than I know it. But my memory testifies I have done terrible things. I have thought 
terrible things. If I was given total freedom, my heart would do awful things. Father, I know who I am and I need to be changed. I need to be redeemed. I need to be forgiven. And the father says, look at what my son, the Lord Jesus, did for you. He died on Calvary. Believe in the work that he did on your behalf and your life will be miraculously changed. I trust that's your testimony. We're not guaranteed any days. We're not promised a certain number of years. That needs to be your testimony today. Father, we're so encouraged by the stories we read because they give us a snapshot of, of who Jesus is and what his personality was like and what his expectations were. And Lord, we know that that's a true and accurate picture that we see in the scriptures. But Father, I'm asking beyond that, that we would experientially know him. That each one here would be determined this day to follow him Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and back here again. Father, we come here to be encouraged in our walk with the Savior. Father, I'm asking that each one here would understand that simple gospel message and would be radically changed by it. Father, this is what we know we can ask for. It's the very mission that you sent the Lord Jesus on. So that is why we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if there's ever a time when we can be of any help to you in the office, personally, my cell phone is on that uh, bulletin, please call. We want to encourage you in the walk you have with God. Well, thank you for being here. God bless you. Now be careful. As soon as you step out, remember your shoes are warm, the ice is cold and frozen, and water will, will, quickly, will quickly be in between you. So take your steps carefully when you go outside. Thank you. God bless you.